Well, in this lecture, we're going to develop a frequency domain interpretation of sampling using the Fourier transform. And we're going to do two objectives here. One is to relate the continuous time frequency, capital omega, to discrete time frequency, lowercase omega. And the second, we'll relate the Fourier transform of the sampled signal to the Fourier transform of the continuous time signal. And this will be our workhorse for an analyzing sampling and learning about how we do reconstruction and so on. So this involves several steps, which I'll outline here. First of all, we're going to find the Fourier transform of a discrete time signal. So we will relate x of n using a Fourier transform to x s of omega. And we're using the subscript s here to denote that it's associated with a discrete time signal in contrast with x of t, which would have Fourier transform x of omega. Then in the second step of this process, we're going to find a continuous time representation for x of n. That is, we're going to relate a signal x s of t using the Fourier transform to x s of omega. And this will be our continuous time version of x of n. And then finally, we will be able to express x s of t as a function of x of t, the original signal that we're sampling, and then we'll take the Fourier transform of that to find out how the Fourier transform of the sampled signal, or the discrete time signal, s, x s of omega, is related to the Fourier transform of the original signal. So that's the process we're going to go through in the next few slides. So we're going to relate continuous time frequency capital omega to discrete time frequency lowercase omega. We'll do this by forcing two sinusoids with the same amplitudes and phase, but one a continuous time sinusoid and the other a discrete time sinusoid to be equal. And we'll learn what that tells us about the relationships between the two frequencies. So if I require that g of n be equal to the samples of my continuous time sinusoid g of n t, which I can write out as a cosine of omega times t times n plus phi, then forcing these two things to be equal, we see that the discrete time frequency lowercase omega must be equal to the continuous time frequency capital omega times the sampling interval t. This is a very important relationship that we'll use extensively and I can write this out in words as well. Discrete time frequency is equal to continuous time frequency times sampling interval. And the units check out as well. The discrete time frequency recall is in units of radians and that is obtained by taking continuous time frequency, which is in radians per second, and multiplying it by the sampling interval in seconds. So we have, again, discrete time frequency lowercase omega is equal to continuous time frequency uppercase omega times the sampling interval. So now we're going to begin the process of relating the Fourier transform of a sampled signal to the Fourier transform of the continuous time signal. We're going to do this in three steps. The first step is to find a Fourier transform representation for a discrete time signal x of n. And recall that a discrete time signal naturally has a discrete time Fourier transform. And we can write that out, x v to j omega is a sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of n e to the minus j omega n. Well, we just showed that omega in discrete time frequency was equal to continuous time frequency times the sampling interval. So if I substitute on the right-hand side for omega, I get that x of n is expressed now in terms of continuous time frequency, which is the Fourier transform frequency, and we'll call that x s of omega and it can be obtained by taking x of e to the j omega, the DTFT, and replacing discrete time frequency by continuous time frequency times the sampling interval. 
or writing this out, it's just the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of n times e to the minus j capital omega t times n. Now that we're given that x s of omega, we just derived the Fourier transform from the samples x of n as the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity x of n times e to the minus j capital omega t n. What we want to do is find out what does this imply about the continuous time signal that has this Fourier transform. In other words, given x s of omega, we want to find x s of t. And to do that, we have to remember a Fourier transform pair that you should have learned in a signals and systems class. And that is, if I take an impulse delta of t and I delay it by n times cap t, the Fourier transform of that signal is e to the minus j omega times t times n. Remember the impulse has for a transform of unity and when I do the delay that's a time shift property that multiplies unity by the complex exponential e to the minus j omega t times n. So if I substitute this for a transform relationship up into this expression I see that on the right hand side I'm going to have x s of t is going to be the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of n times delta of t minus nt. So this is our continuous time representation for x of n. We can sketch what that looks like and what it has is a sequence of impulses spaced by capital T so this is at time t, this is at 2t, this is at 3t, let's make this 0, minus t, and so on. And the strength of this, these impulses, this one is x of 0, this one is x of 1, x of 2, x of minus 1. Okay, so that's our continuous time representation for this discrete time signal which follows just from using the relationship between continuous and discrete time frequency and this particular Fourier transform pair. So our final step then is to express this Fourier transform of the sampled or the discrete time signal as a function of the Fourier transform of the original signal. And recall in the previous step we showed that we had this continuous time representation for a discrete time signal that consisted of the train of impulses whose amplitudes are modulated or adjusted by the size of the corresponding value of the discrete time signal. Now if I use the fact that x of n is equal to the samples of the original continuous time signal at time nt, I can rewrite this as the sum n equals minus infinity to infinity of x of nt times delta of t minus nt. And now we'll use the fact that x of t times delta of t minus nt is identical to x of nt times delta of t minus nt. Because what happens when I multiply signal x by this impulse, the only value that matters is the value at the time where the impulse is located, which is at nt. So as I substitute this relationship into my expression here on the right, I'm going to obtain that x s of t is a sum n equals minus infinity to infinity x of t delta of t minus nt, and now I notice that x doesn't depend on n anymore, so I can pull this outside the sum and write this as the product of x of t and a signal s of t, where s of t is a sum n equals minus infinity to infinity of delta of t minus nt. Now at this point, we can take a Fourier transform of both sides of this equation. 
And on the left-hand side, we're going to have x sub s of omega. And on the right-hand side, we've got the Fourier transform of a product, which is just the convolution of the Fourier transforms divided by 2 pi. So I'll write this as 1 over 2 pi x of omega convolved with s of omega. So now we've achieved our goal of expressing the Fourier transform of the sample signal as a function of the Fourier transform of the original continuous time signal. But we want to simplify this a little bit so we can get a better understanding. And we'll use the fact, which we derived in a previous lecture, that I can take the Fourier transform of s of t and I obtain that s of omega is 2 pi over t, the sum k equals minus infinity to infinity, delta of omega minus k 2 pi divided by t. Recall this is an impulse train in time, and it's one of those signals where the Fourier transform has the same shape as the time domain signal. So we also get an impulse train in frequency where the height of the impulses or their strength is 2 pi over t and they're spaced by multiples of 2 pi over t. So if I substitute this Fourier transform into my expression for xs of omega, well the 2 pi's cancel and I get 1 over t times the sum k equals minus infinity to infinity of x of omega convolved with delta of omega minus k 2 pi over t. Now convolution with impulses is particularly simple if you recall that what happens is the impulse shifts the signal to the t location at which the impulse is centered. So in this case it's just going to replace omega by omega minus k 2 pi over t and we finally get our expression that we'll be using extensively here, that excess of omega is this sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of x of omega minus k 2 pi over t. So we take the original Fourier transform and it gets replicated an infinite number of times where each of those replicates are shifted by an interval 2 pi over t. Summarizing this We've shown now that discrete time frequency lowercase omega is equal to continuous time frequency uppercase omega times the sampling interval t. And if a signal x of t is for a transform x of omega, and we define a discrete time signal based on samples of the continuous time signal, then we can say that the Fourier transform of the sampled signal x of n which we'll call xs of omega, is 1 over t times the sum k equals minus infinity to infinity of the original Fourier transform shifted by multiples of 2 pi over t. Suppose that our x of omega is, that's our continuous time signal for a transform. Then what happens here when we look at sampling is we get xs of omega. So we're going to have a sum with indices going k from minus infinity to infinity. And when k is equal to 0, we just get x of omega. So we'll draw that one here. And the amplitude of that is now 1 over t. So this is the uh, k equals 0 term. Then when I have k equal to 1, I have x of omega minus k 2 pi over t. So I take this original signal, x of omega, and I shift it to be centered on 2 pi over t. So this is my k equals 1 term. And then when k is equal to 2, I have x of omega shifted to 4 pi over t. This gives me my k equals 2 term. And this process continues to the right. And then let's look at k equals minus 1. When k is equal to minus 1, I have x of omega plus 2 pi over t, which shifts x of omega to the left. So this is my k equals minus 1. And similarly, I'll have at minus 4 pi over t of k equals minus 2. And this process continues. So we've found how the Fourier transform of our sample signal is related 
to the Fourier transform of the original signal. And this relationship has some pretty profound implications for choosing sampling rate and how you reconstruct and so on that we'll explore next.